We're here this morning because of the song we just sang, Jesus Saves. He saved us all by his blood and we're thankful for that and we are here to worship him and praise his glorious name. So good to see every one of you who are here this morning. May God bless you. If you have your Bible with you, can I please encourage you to take it out and go over into a book that hopefully you're getting familiar with by now, the Gospel of John. Please take out your Bibles and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, I want to read the first four verses of the Gospel of John and let that kind of just set up the things we want to talk about this morning and our study from the Word of God. Hope you're ready to study. Hope you have a Bible with you. We're going to have a lot of Bible in this sermon this morning. So we're going to start with John chapter 1 and verse number 1. John 1 and verse 1, the Gospel of John begins with these words. It says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Ladies and gentlemen, today marks the beginning of the last quarter of this year. I mean, can you believe that? Can you believe that we've actually reached the last quarter of 2017? I don't know about you, but to me, it seems like 2017 just started a few days ago. But we're already in the last quarter of it. There are only three more months left in 2017. And that also means that we are near the end of our Bible reading challenge. Remember this year in our pursuit to be all in for Jesus, we made a goal to read at least one chapter a day, five days a week of the New Testament. We said that if we were consistent in that, then by the end of the year, we should have read the whole New Testament. In fact, if you've been keeping up with that Bible reading, then I'm happy to tell you this morning that as you sit there in that pew, you have read 23 of the 27 New Testament books. In 2017, you have read the majority of the New Testament letters. And you have read the wonderful and powerful book of Acts. And you've even read three out of the four Gospels. You've read three out of the four Gospels. In fact, i got to tell you that for me personally, I have enjoyed rereading the Gospels more than anything else. I really enjoyed rereading the Gospels because in them we learn the truth about Jesus, we learn the truth about his identity. We learn the truth about the identity of Jesus in the four Gospels. In fact, this is something that all the Gospel writers deal with immediately in their accounts. For example, if you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew begins his account by, by emphasizing how Jesus comes from the lineage of Abraham and David. He emphasizes how, how Jesus it is the prophesied Messiah. But Mark begins his account by emphasizing how Jesus is the Son of God. Luke begins his account by emphasizing how Jesus is the Son of Man, how he's connected to all humanity. But then we come to the Gospel of John, this book we are reading right now. And John may actually provide the most powerful and the, and the strongest introduction of Jesus than anywhere else in the Bible. You see, instead of introducing Jesus with, with, with genealogy or with his virgin birth or with his baptism or even with his ministry that begins in Galilee, instead of introducing Jesus in that way, he chooses to introduce him by taking us back to the beginning. He, he takes us back to the beginning. I want you to notice again the first three words of the Gospel of John. Notice how the Gospel of John begins with the words, in the beginning. In the beginning, that's how the Gospel of John opens up. And let me just ask you, can you recall any other book in the Bible that begins the very same way? I'm pretty sure that you can. I'm pretty sure that as you sit there this morning, you can recall how the book of Genesis begins in the very same way. The book of Genesis also begins with the words, in the beginning. In the beginning, see, here as the Gospel of John opens up, the writer John is clearly trying to get our minds to go back to the book of Genesis. 
He is clearly trying to get our minds to go back to the beginning, go back to the creation of the world. He wants us to know that Jesus was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning. In fact, beyond telling us that he was there in the beginning, I want you to also notice how John reveals three important things that we need to understand about who Jesus was in the beginning. You see, according to the Apostle John, the Lord Jesus, he was there in the beginning. And one of the things we need to understand is we need to understand that in the beginning, he was the word. He was the word of God. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 1 again. And John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was was God. Notice how John begins introducing Jesus by calling him the Word. Do you see that? He calls him the Word. You know, that terminology, the Word, that's very interesting. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, that is very interesting. That's very interesting terminology. In fact, I want to suggest that that terminology that John uses here, it can be challenging to understand. It can be somewhat confusing and puzzling for a lot of people to grasp today. And, and so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about what John means when he, fer, when he refers to Jesus as the word. What does he mean there? Well, I think we can all agree that words are a big part of our lives. I think we can all agree that as human beings, we use words all the time. We use words all throughout the day, every single day. And why do we use words? Well, we use words to express ourselves. We use words to communicate with each other. We use words to express ideas and explain things in our lives each and every day. We use words to accomplish those purposes. And if we can understand that then I believe that we can also understand what John means when he refers to Jesus as the Word. You see, we need to understand this morning that Jesus came into this world not just to die for the sins of the world on a cross, but he also came into this world to communicate something. He also came into this world to communicate or explain the Father. That is, he came into this world to tell people who the Father was and what exactly the Father requires of them in their lives. He came in here to communicate that. And so we go to John chapter 1 and we look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. John 1 verse 17, it says, For the law, talking about that Old Testament law, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth. Notice that. Grace and truth will realize through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father, he, Jesus, has explained him. Notice how John says that Jesus, Jesus explained the Father. He explained the Father in heaven. And I guess the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean that, that Jesus, Jesus explained the Father? Well, we need to understand that Jesus, what this means, he came into this world and he revealed the truth about the Father. He revealed the truth about the love of the Father and the grace of the Father and the forgiveness and justice and desire of the Father to have a relationship with mankind. His greatest creation, Jesus came into this world to reveal the truth about these things. To reveal the truth about the Father. Look at John 1 and verse 14. John 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh. That's how we know the Word is Jesus. Jesus is the only one to come from heaven as God and put on flesh. The Word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. He lived among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Notice how Jesus, when he was on this earth living in the flesh, he was full of two things. He was full of grace and he was full of truth. He was full of grace and truth. And in fact, Jesus himself emphasizes this in John 14 verse 6 when he says, I am the way. The truth in the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says he is the truth. He is the truth, that is, he's the source of truth. 
That is, when he was here on this earth, he was the full embodiment of truth. That is, he came into this world to testify of the truth, to let us know that there is such a thing as truth, and he is the truth. That's what Jesus came into this world for. And I got to tell you, living in a world like we do today, it is such a blessing to know this. Living in a world like we do today, where truth seems to be relative and subjective, where people are changing the rules all the time and they're changing the standard for morality all the time, living in a world like that, ladies and gentlemen, it is good to know that according to the Bible, there is such a thing as truth, and Jesus is it. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the source of truth. Jesus has been with the Father from all eternity, and he came into this world to explain him and testify of him and communicate his love and his grace and his forgiveness to all men. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to reveal the love of God and the grace of God and the justice of God. He came into this world to reveal the truth from heaven, but unfortunately for many people in his time, they didn't recognize it. They didn't recognize that he was the truth. I'm going back to John chapter 1. Look at verse 11. John chapter 1 and verse 11. There John says he, referring to Jesus, came to his own. And those who were of his own, they did not receive him. Notice the language John uses there. Those who were of his own, they did not receive him. Who is he talking about there? Where clearly he's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about the Hebrew people. He's talking about the descendants of Abraham, those who should have been the most prepared to receive the Messiah when he came onto the scene. According to John, most of the Jewish people, they did not receive Jesus. They did not receive the truth that he revealed from heaven. Unfortunately, they rejected him as the Messiah because he was not the Messiah that they wanted. He was not the Messiah that they had anticipated. He was not the Messiah doing the things that they wanted a Messiah to do. They rejected the truth of Jesus. The question is, what about us? What are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with the truth that has been revealed from heaven? Are we going to accept it or are we going to reject it? I want to suggest to you that if we accept the truth that comes from Jesus, we're going to have one of the greatest blessings in life. You see, when we accept the truth that comes from Jesus, we're going to have something that leads to real freedom in life. Remember in John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you'll know the truth. And the truth will do what? It'll set you free. There Jesus is talking about spiritual freedom, freedom from our sins. When we accept the truth, then we're going to be led to real freedom. When we accept the truth, then we're going to have something rock solid and sure. That is, no matter what laws are passed by our politicians, no matter where our, where our culture is thinking about a particular moral issue shifts throughout the years, no matter what circumstances we're facing in our personal lives, the truth of Jesus will never change. The truth of Jesus will never go away. The truth of Jesus will never be destroyed. It will never cease to be so. No matter what happens in this world, brothers and sisters, the fact that God is real and he loves us, that will always be true. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that will always be true. The moral standard that is found being promoted in the gospel, that's always going to be true. The fact that the Lord is going to come back one day like a thief. And the dead are going to be raised and the judgment day will take place. And the faithful will go to heaven to receive a crown of life. That will always be true. No matter what happens in this world, the truth of Jesus will endure. It will last forever. It will never change regardless of physical circumstances. What I just want you to see is at the beginning of the Gospel of John, John wants us to know something about Jesus. He wants us to know that Jesus was there in the beginning... And he was the word. He was the word who would eventually put on flesh. He was the word who came into the world to reveal the truth, to testify of the Father and be the full physical embodiment of the love, grace, and justice of God. In the beginning, Jesus was there. And he was the word. 
He was the truth, but not only was he the word. A second thing we need to understand, according to John, is Jesus in the beginning was also God. He was the word and he was also God. I'm going back to John chapter 1 and looking at verse number 1. And John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was there in the beginning with God. Notice how John says that in addition to being the word, in the beginning Jesus was also God. He was also God, that is, he was also deity. That is, like God the Father, Jesus is also part of the Godhead. This is something that John emphasizes here and all throughout this section. He really wants us to understand this. For example, going back to these verses we just read in John chapter 1, notice how John says that we can be sure about the deity of Jesus. We can be sure about the fact that Jesus is God because he was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning. Again, that that language is critical. That language that Jesus was in there in the beginning with God is clearly taking us back to Genesis chapter 1. That is clearly designed to take us back to the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible. Right away, John wants us to know that Jesus was a big part of what you read in Genesis 1 and verse 1. He was a big part of that verse where that verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John wants us to know that Jesus was a big part of that verse. He wants us to know that he was there with the Father in the beginning. Because like him, he too is eternal. He's eternal like God the Father. Like God the Father, he also has no beginning and no end. Like God the Father, he is also the Alpha and the Omega. He is also from everlasting to everlasting. He did not come into existence during the virgin birth. No, he already existed because he's everlasting. He's everlasting. That's what John wants us to know. In fact, that's something that Jesus emphasized in his ministry. You still in the Gospel of John? Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm going to verse number 57. John chapter 8, verse 57, once Jesus, or after Jesus, told these hostile Jews that Abraham was glad to see his day. Abraham was glad to see a day when a Messiah would come. In verse number 57 of John chapter 8, it says, so the Jews said, you're not 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Abraham's been dead 2,000 years by this time. They say you're not even 50 years old. You've seen Abraham. Verse 58, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Verse 59, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Notice how here Jesus says that before Abraham was even born, I am. I am. Do you by any chance recognize that language? You recognize that language? Do you recall how this same language you find here is also found in Exodus chapter 3 when God talked to Moses through the burning bush? Remember in Exodus chapter 3, God told Moses to tell the people of Israel that the I am has sent him. You see, there when God refers to himself as the I am, he's talking about his eternal nature. He's talking about how he is timeless, how he has no beginning and he has no end. That's what God is referring to when he calls himself the I am in Exodus chapter 3. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 8 when he used the same language. Here Jesus is saying that before Abraham was even born, he existed. He was there. He is the I am because he's also eternal. He's God because he's eternal, but not only is he eternal, the second thing we need to understand about Jesus is he's also the creator. How often do you think about that? Jesus is the creator. Go back to Genesis. We're going to come back to John. But look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Remember, in Genesis 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, Well, look at verse 26 of the same chapter. Then God said, Let us not not just the father but we're talking about the godhead we're talking about the father the son and the holy spirit we're talking about how all three members of the godhead they were there in the beginning and they were working 
They were all part of the creation. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God was there in the beginning and it was all three members of the Godhead. I want you to go now to John, John again. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse number 3. John chapter 1 and verse number 3. And talking about Jesus, John says... All things came into being through him, through the word, through Jesus. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Look at Colossians chapter 1. The apostle Paul talks about the same thing in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Colossians 1 and verse 15. Here Paul is talking about Jesus. And he says he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. The idea of firstborn is the idea of having preeminence over everything in creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, for his glory. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to see how the Bible is clear about this subject. Both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the creator. He is the creator of all things. He is the one who executed the words of God the Father when God the Father said, let there be light. It was Jesus who executed those words. He created the Son. And the moon and the stars. He created the land animals and the, and the creatures in the sea. He even created us, mankind. Jesus made you and he made me. He made us in the image of God. He is the creator. He's the creator because he is God. But not only is he the creator, he's also the source of life. In Jesus, there's life, brothers and sisters. Go back to John again. John chapter 1 and verse 4. John chapter 1 and verse 4, I've been telling us that he made all things. And verse 4, John says, in him was what? Was life. In Jesus, there's life. That is, in Jesus, you're going to find the source of life. And in Jesus, you will find not only the source of physical life, but more importantly, you're going to find the source of spiritual life. Jesus is the source of real spiritual life in heaven with God. In John chapter 14 to verse 6, remember Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says he's the, he's the life. He's the source of physical life, and he's the source of spiritual life. But I just want you to see it's at the beginning of the gospel of John. John, wants, he wants us to know something. He wants us to know something about Jesus. He wants us to know that Jesus wasn't just a man. He wasn't just some Jewish rabbi that popped up onto the scene. He wasn't just some prophet. No, he is God. He was, in fact, God in the flesh. He was, in fact, both fully God and fully man at the same time. And Jesus, for the first time in human history and the only time, you have deity actually stepping out of heaven and walking into our time and space. He's God. That's the truth about him. And the question is, how are we going to respond to that? How are we going to respond to the fact that Jesus is God? Well, I want to suggest there are at least three things we need to do. First, we need to respond to this by worshiping him. We need to worship Jesus. We need to worship him just like we worship all the other members of the Godhead. Like we worship God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. We also need to worship Jesus. We also need to praise his glorious name every time we come to those doors because he possesses all of the attributes of deity. In fact, several times in the gospel, we find people bowing down and worshiping Jesus, and Jesus never stops them. Jesus never says, oh, don't worship me. No, he never says that. In fact, he accepts the worship because he understood who he was. He understood that he's God, and he's worthy of man's worship. We need to worship Jesus. And we also need to trust Jesus. We need to trust the instructions he's given us in his word. And we also need to trust in his ability to help us in our lives. We need to trust that since he knows everything, that means he's fully capable of helping us. We need to trust that he knows everything about everything. He knows everything about us because, again, he made us. He even knows what's going on in our hearts right now. 
John emphasizes that in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. There John says that Jesus knows what's going on in the hearts of men. He knows everything, so we need to trust him. We need to trust him. We also need to stand in awe of him. In Psalm 33, verse 8, the psalmist says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Do you remember uh, about two or three weeks ago we had a lesson about the awesome God and we talked about how we need to, we need to stand in awe of God? That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says here. That certainly would include standing in awe of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need to stand in awe of Jesus. We need to stand in awe of his creation. We need to stand in awe of all these things we look around and see and understand that he made those things. He made that sun, that moon, and those mountains. He made it all. And we need to stand in awe of that. We need to stand in awe of his power. We need to stand in awe of all the miracles we can read about him performing in the gospel. We need to stand in awe of his love and his grace and his forgiveness. We need to stand in awe of the fact that while he was on this earth, he was both fully God and fully man at the same time. Try to get your mind wrapped around that. I really struggle with that. We need to stand in awe of the fact that he was deity in a human body. And as deity in a human body, he suffered and died on a cross. Even though he could have stopped all that at any moment. Even though he could have called legions of angels, he still allowed people to spit on him and, and put a crown of thorns in his head like we saw on the slide this morning during the Lord's Supper. And he allowed people to beat him and put nails in his hands and in his feet. He was willing to serve his creation in the highest possible level by dying on a cross, we need to stand in awe of that. I mean, these are all incredible and unfathomable things to ponder on. When you really stop and consider what John tells us about Jesus in the beginning, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but not only was the Word with God and was God, a third thing John says is we need to understand that in the beginning, the word was the light of men. The light of men. Go back to John chapter 1 again. John 1. We start with verse number 4 this time. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. So that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. You know, when I was a little kid, I was actually afraid of the dark. Anyone here was ever afraid of the dark as a kid? I was. Maybe I'm the only one. When I was a kid, I usually slept with a night light. Maybe until I was about seven years old because I was afraid of the dark. I didn't like the dark at all as a kid. I'm pretty sure that many of you may feel the same way about, about the dark even as adults. You see, for a lot of people, in fact, for most people, they don't like darkness. They don't like darkness because when it's dark, it's hard to see where you're going. It's hard to navigate your way through darkness. It's hard to walk through darkness or run through darkness. And it's especially hard to drive through darkness. Many of you will agree with that, right? It's hard to see where you're going when it's dark. But not only that, darkness is usually when evil lurks. Statistics prove that most crimes are committed, guess when? At night. Most homes and cars are broken to at night. Most murders in case of assault are, are committed at night. Evil usually lurks in the night, and we all understand that. In fact, that's why we do things like lock our doors and turn on the porch light at night. That's why we make sure we check our doors before we go to bed at night. We do those kinds of things because we understand that criminals usually do most of their walking at night. See, when it comes to darkness, it's got a lot of negative connotations to it. But you contrast that with the light. You see, unlike what you have with darkness, when you have light, ladies and gentlemen, you have something then that's extremely powerful. In fact, you have one of the most powerful forces in the world. When you have light, you have something that illuminates and helps you navigate your way through the darkness. You have something that can help you see where to go, help you find your way around. You have something that will, 
that will expose things. Let me tell you something. When a child has a light on in their room, they're never going to be able to mistake in a coat rack or a stuffed animal for a monster. You know why? Because the light in the room will expose the realities for them. Light always exposes the realities in the room. And it does that all the time. It does that all throughout life. You see, light reveals the truth. Light shines. Light shows us things for what they really are. And that's exactly what Jesus came into this world to do. Jesus came into this world to be the light of the world. We saw that in John chapter 1. I want you to go now to John chapter 8. There are so many verses in the gospel of John where Jesus clearly says this. I put them in your outline this morning, but due to time, I just want to read one. John chapter 8 and verse 12. John 8 and verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me when I walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice how Jesus says, he is the light. He is the light of the world. That is, he came into this world to show men where to go. He came into this world to show men where to go spiritually. He came into this world to give me and you spiritual direction. And in fact, I think he's alluding to that in John 14 and verse 6 again. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Notice how Jesus says that if we're going to make it to heaven at all, it's going to have to go be going through his way. He says, I'm the way. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the way to a relationship with the Father. Jesus is the light because he provides spiritual direction. He provides a path to heaven. But not only is he the light because of that, he's also the light. Because through his life and his teachings, he exposes sin. He exposes wickedness and darkness and, and the evil deeds of men. You, you see, through his gospel that we have before us today, we see exactly what sin is and what sin is not, don't we? Through the gospel, we see exactly what pleases God and what doesn't please God. You see, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the light, we see clearly that contrary to what our culture preaches to us today, lying and adultery and lust and fornication, that is sex outside of the marriage bed, all of those things are wrong. All of those things are sin. Sins, none of those things need to be celebrated. Through the gospel, which is the light, we learn that things like vain worship and hearts of covetousness and greed and idolatry, that is, any time we put something before God, all those things are wrong. All those things are sins. You see, through the teachings of Jesus, the wicked deeds of men are exposed. They're brought to light. The question is, what are we going to do with that light? What are we going to do with the light that Jesus provides? Are we going to walk in it? Are we going to allow it to shine and illuminate in our hearts and in our lives, or are we going to reject and continue to walk in the darkness? What are we going to do with the light that Jesus gives us? I ask you that because the light doesn't do you any good if you don't walk in it. Are we going to walk in the light? And are we going to shine our lights as Christians? Remember in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, Jesus says, when he talks to us Christians, he says, you are the light of the world. Remember in Matthew 5 and verse 16, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Jesus commands us to be lights. Jesus commands us to shine our lights like he shined his light. That is, we ought to be noticeable and different from the world. That is, by the way we live our lives every single day, we are to stand out and be a walking Bible. When people look at us in our neighborhoods and on our jobs and our schools, they ought to immediately be able to see something different about us. They ought to immediately be able to see that we're disciples, we're Christians, we are people who follow Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and that means we have a high standard of morals, love, and inner peace. Like Jesus, the light, we got to be light. We got to shine our lights in this dark and sinful world every single day. But I just want you to see the gospel of John opens up, man, in a powerful and a unique way. Do you see that? The gospel of John opens up by telling us so many important things about Jesus. He, he tells us that he's the word. 
He was the physical embodiment of truth walking around on this earth. And, and he's also God. And he's also the light of men sent to shine in this dark and sinful world. That's the truth about your Savior and my Savior. The question is, have you given your life to him? Have you given your life to God? Have you given your life to the word? Have you given your life to the light who came to shine and expose the evil deeds of men? If you and I have done those things, if you and I have given your life to Jesus, then I want you to know you have yet to fulfill your purpose in life. I want you to know that this morning, right here and right now, you have an opportunity to finally give your life to Jesus and walk in the light that he provides. Whether that means responding to the gospel for the first time through faith, belief in him, repentance of sin, and baptism for remission of sins. Or if you were at one time walking in the light, but maybe you've started walking in darkness. If you need to repent and get back into the light of men, if we can help you with any spiritual thing at all when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. We want to help you with that right here and right now as we stand and as we sing this song.